Absolutely. Um, Robert, I um, wanted to talk to you just about where we are in, in, in government right now. I mean, where, I mean, you've now left that advisory role. But how the government makes their decisions about the rules they bring in, the rules they end, uh, moving into lockdowns and like the decision to roll out the boosters as a primary uh, source of uh, or primary way we're going to tackle this new variant, um, but also bringing in mask mandates and other rules to, uh, this week. What do you make of all of that? Well, I don't think uh, at this stage that we can entirely divorce the science and the politics. Um, clearly, there is something to be concerned about in the emergence of the Omicron variant. Uh, but the, the South Africans are, I think, genuinely troubled by the extent to which the Northern Hemisphere is panicking about it. And I, I think we're seeing a particular response in this country because of the, the way it functions as a dead cat for the uh, for the government i mean the the prime minister's had a pretty shocking couple of weeks and now we have something that allows him to present himself as in charge and directing and doing things and possibly competent and um, whether those things are effective or not and whether they're proportionate or not so this is for you this is about politics rather than about tackling a virus well it's as much about politics as it is about science i think and i i as a sociologist who studies science and technology, I'm, uh, I find it very much harder to prize those things apart than uh, some of the people who think that you know, science tells us what to do. Yeah. You know, science gives us a lot of useful information, but what we decide to do is a social and a, and a political judgment. And that's something a lot of people who, especially the media and politicians say, follow the science. Well, they, I mean, by definition, there isn't the science. Science is a constantly developing, moving feast, isn't it? And it should be challenged and questioned and evidence as it changes. Your views should change. And, and we've just not seen very much of that, even though actually over the course of this pandemic, we've learned lots, lots more about uh, the virus and lots more about treatments and, and, and what thing, what non-pharmaceutical uh, me uh, methods for tackling uh, interventions, whether they actually work and whether they don't work. You particularly on social media yesterday, you raised the issue of uh, face masks and the fact that they've been brought back in as mandatory in England, in shops, at public transport. Also, it turns out lots of other places as well, in including you know hairdressers, estate agents, uh, vet surgeries and all, and all of that, uh, but not in hospitality. Um, what do you make of, of the decision to bring the mask mandate back? Well, I think this has very much to do with the desire to be seen to be doing something. I mean, it's very visible, you know, policy on face masks. But, I mean, as I've said on numerous occasions since last summer, summer of 2020, um, we've not conducted proper research to find out whether they actually work or not. Um, and the accumulating evidence is that the, uh, the effect of a face mask, the value of face mask, is, is nil to minimal. Um, we we have a body of work which has been put together, much of it flawed, um, much of it problematic in quality, but without showing any consistent strong signal that there is any benefit to, you know, to the community in the general adoption of face masks. Indeed, I mean, when we have seen any research, I mean, it's either been computer models, it's been using um, medical grade masks. Um, we've seen there's a big study in Bangladesh involving thousands of people, which some people have claimed show this massive big difference. And, and, and it simply hasn't. And it's the, the, the methodology has been highly questioned by uh, by scientists who know a lot better than certainly than me on how these things work. And we, and we see the real world experiments, don't we? The the, the American states that didn't that, that didn't have mask mandates. We see even you know Wales, Scotland and England. There's, that's been one big experiment. We've seen case rates no different, indeed sometimes higher in Wales and Scotland, despite them having a, a mask mandate where we haven't had one in England uh, for quite a few months um, and no difference. So, I mean, the real world evidence is, is really adding up that they really don't do anything, which is, by the way, exactly what we were told about the spring 2020 by pretty much everyone who's currently telling us to wear a mask. All of the leading experts advising the government were telling us masks don't make any difference. Well, indeed, I, I think we should just be a little bit careful about the comparisons with Wales and Scotland, because, I mean, one of the difficulties about deciding whether masks work or not is that they're often part of a package of interventions. Yeah. And we don't know which bits of the package work and which bits of the package don't work. Um, but it, it's clear that 
the, the more stringent levels of restriction in Scotland and Wales have not visibly made a difference to the trajectory, to the course of the, of, of the pandemic in, in those nations. Um, and, you know, if the, if the masks have played any part in that, we simply, again, have not done the research that would allow us to find out. Yeah. And in terms of, you, you were previously on the JCVI. This is the body that advises the government on the rollout of the vaccines. Um, even though you know, you're a sociologist rather than epidemiologist or, or you know, a virology expert. Um, but, but you and many others who are not specifically experts on viruses, you've played a role in advising the government on what on what will be acceptable to British people, how to almost sell policies to the British people. What do you make of the decision to roll out the boosters to everyone over the age of 18, double jabs now for 12 to 15 year olds um, and even fourth jabs for those immunosuppressed? Well, this is not likely to do any great harm and will probably do some good. In practice, the uh, the, the operational issues mean that there probably won't be a lot of difference in when people actually get vaccines. Um, I, I think it's very unlikely that the NHS is going to be able to mount the sort of effort that we saw in the uh, this spring. Yeah. Um, and where people were literally happily queuing up to get their vaccines. Well, indeed, I mean, the premise, many of the premises that use vaccine hubs have now reverted to their uh, everyday use. Uh, many of the volunteers have now got jobs and they've gone back to work. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be possible to get uh, the same kind of speed and capacity as we as we saw earlier. So that, if you like, allowing people to get jabs from three months after their last dose, in practice, I suspect that most, mostly it will be four or four, five, even six months, um, especially as JCVI has been very insistent that the NHS should call people forward according to the existing priority groups so that, you know, those at greater risk uh, get, the, uh, get access to the vaccines first. But I, I certainly encourage anybody who is invited to, uh, to come forward uh, and to take up the, the offer. Um, it will certainly make a make a contribution, and it will probably make more of a contribution than any of the NPIs, except possibly working from home. Yeah. Uh, I think this is the only thing, in, in in my view, that's been really affected through the pandemic. And of course, it's the last thing that the government want to to be pushing people to do again. Yeah, because of course the economic impact on all the other people uh, who don't work from home. Um, really appreciate you joining us. Very thoughtful uh, comments from you there. Professor Robert Dingwell, Professor of Sociology at Nottingham Trent University, previously was on the JCVI Committee Advising the Government. It's coming up to 9.33.